Good afternoon. The next talk is, a, is by Frank Kalicek, the founder of OwnCloud and NetCloud. Have fun. Thank you. Thanks a lot for coming to my talk. The topic is, as you know, why I forked my own company and project. So this is uh, probably the question that I've been asked the most the last one and a half years. So I'm really happy to talk about this here. It's also a story of um, like how open source communities works, how open source licensing works, um, how, we, how we as an open source community are, are paid and how this all ecosystem works. So I'm really happy to talk about this here at Foster because as you all know, this is like the biggest completely community driven open source event here. Um, so this totally fits the, fits the idea behind this uh, story. So my name is Frank Kalicek. I'm an open source guy for a long time. So I started to contribute 20 years ago. Yes, I'm old. Um, <laughs> I started to um, contribute first in the KDE project um, where I got um, involved um, in all kinds of different roles and really learned how open source communities can work, should work. Um, I founded Open Desktop Org Network a little bit later with all kinds of initiatives, um, but I'm probably most well known and also probably invited here as the founder of the Own Cloud project and also the Next Cloud project. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the history, like my personal history and the history of these projects because I think it's really important to have the right context um, to understand what, what really happened here and what the reasons are and how to avoid it next time. Um, then uh, obviously a little bit about the history of own cloud, then some of the issues um, that we had, um, not only me, but the community and other people, um, then obviously the fork, next cloud, and then a little bit of a status where we are with next cloud at the moment. Um, at the end, I hope that we still have time for questions. I try to be um, relatively quick with my talk and then have a discussion with all of you because I think this is the can be the most interesting part because you're all also involved in open source. I'm looking forward to questions and feedback and ideas. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the, the history. So this is like in this case, the first slide, my personal history. My personal history is with KDE, as I said. I got involved in KDE 20 years ago, like the end of the 90s. This was um, when a friend of, me, of mine um, showed me KDE 1.0 beta 1 or something, or beta 2, I don't remember. And I looked at it, wow, this is like, this really, this looks like Windows 95. This is really awesome, right? <laughs> Good old times. Um, and what, what basically blew me away the most was that this was done in a collaborative way from community people over the internet without a, money, uh, without a company involved, like a pure community project. This really, um, this really, I find it so fascinating that this crowdsourced development thing could work. This was, at least for me, really new at the time. Um, completely community driven, like all the decision making was done by the community, there was no real company involved. There were some companies contributing pieces to KDE, but not really the overall picture. Of course with KDE everybody can contribute, right, there wasn't really, there was no like you have to be an elite developer to have commit rights or something. With KDE you just like send a mail to an address, say hey can I have an, an account, you get an account and you commit. Right? This is how it works. I find it super, super fascinating at the time. Obviously, it's all free software. It's very important if you collaborate across um, communities, peoples, continents, then it's important that you have an equal playing field. You have some kind of agreement, a contract, like how this all works together. In this case, it's of course free software licenses, which guarantee the rights of everybody. Really important. Um, and at the time, this was really like, this was like the high times of like the, the Linux desktop, right? So we all hoped that uh, the year of the Linux desktop will be next year. I mean, some of you remember still the discussion, right? <laughs> so obviously we are so close, right? We have just one, one tiny improvement and then we are there. Then we take over the world. This was and this. It will be next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree, maybe. <laughs> so this was the, was the good old times. Of course, there were also like problems that I and others saw with this approach is that we had a really f fast turnaround with contributors because the way this usually works is you have a student, you contribute, and at some point you're done with your studies, and then you get a real job, and maybe a family and kids, and then you don't have time anymore to work on, on, on open source free software, then you do something else, and then new people come in. 
So for me, it was always like the dream if there's a way to somehow pay people to do free software. It was always like, hey, if we can do this, then we have this really senior people who know what they're doing. They have like so much experience. And then we can really push like the Linux desktop and everything else around the ecosystem forward. And I can really like overtake Microsoft and all the others. Um, and this would be, would be so nice. So this was always the dream for me. Then a little bit later in 2010, I founded OwnCloud. This was uh, still at the time, um, a very briefly a KDE project under the KDE umbrella, but then a little bit later independent. Of course, when I, when I did this, I basically uh, applied all the patterns and the ideas that I learned from KDE to this, which means it also was, of course, completely free software, HGPL in that case. Um, and then um, there was no real review process. I mean, we developed this over time, of course, but everybody was welcome, could contribute. So really open, really open community. Then the community of con contributors grew like really fast. We did the first meetings, we released the first versions, 1.0, 1.0, 1.2, 2.0, and so on. It was really nice. We were then re relatively quickly the, the, the most popular file sync and share solution. File sync and share is an interesting term because at the beginning I didn't know what this software is that I found it. There was no name for it. A little bit later, Gartner, this big analyst company in the US, came up with this term enterprise file sync and share, which is now the category. But at the time, there was no real name for it. But we were really relatively quickly the most popular ones in this space, also very early. Um, so um, the press started to write about it. Even like companies called me and said, hey, we know that this is a sort of a hobby project, but can we use it too? And can we pay you somehow? So this really, when it basically, there was a momentum there. Um, and again, there was the question to me, Okay, great. I mean, this is growing, but can we somehow pay people to do this full time? This was the question. So a little bit later, um, end of 2011, um, I got in contact with some, some people and where we discussed, okay, maybe we can found a, com a company around this. So this was this idea, this vision, hey, maybe we can have a community, an open source community project and an open source free software company and we all do this win-win situation, right? Great marketing, <laughs> work together, have synergies, and then do this together. Got in contact with these people. Um, one um, wanted, to have to, uh, wanted to be the CEO, the other sales and marketing, and I took over the role of uh, CTO, which uh, was responsible for the, for the development uh, technology side. And then, well, 2011, and if it, end of it, we really founded a company around it. Um, this was then called uh, Own Cloud Inc. The reason is that it's a company based in the US, in Boston. The reason for that is that, um, well, one of my co-founders uh, lived there, so this was convenient. And also like the venture capital company that we got from day one also was based there. So this was basically the idea of it. And of course, if you know something about the venture capital world, the startup world in the US, you know that this is all about speed and getting big really fast and then of course then selling it and make a big profit out of it. So this was the game basically here. Um, of course, it also meant that we couldn't like grow the company in the right organic way. It was just hiring people and really fast and growing, which then also meant that some of the people were not really familiar with how open source and community development works. The management, some of the management were not really, didn't really know how this, what this thing is. They just saw it as, hey, here's free code Let's take it and do whatever we want. Um, some of my friends from KDE were skeptical at the time, if this was a good idea. Um, of course, they were right, looking back. <laughs> but um, yeah, for me, it was like um, I thought that this is a good idea to try this experiment to basically create this synergy between a community project and a company. And of course, as you can predict already here, as you can see, there were some issues that occurred over time. So um, I don't want to go into too much detail here, right? It has always something to do with people and other thing. I really don't want to talk too much about details, but I can give you a few examples. So um, overall, there was a really not a really good alignment between the interest of like the management and investor capital guys and the community. Um, one reason is that if you're an open source contributor to a project and you really care about building something that's sustainable, that still exists in a few years, 
you also want to use it for whatever you want. You really want to build something up that's useful for a lot of people, for yourself, for your friends, and it's not going, not going away. Something that still exists. And of course, on the other side, there's the interest of making like quick money. I think open source people, I think it's fair to say, don't have a problem with making money, I guess. <laughs> but the question is if it's sustainable or if it's just like, yeah, in a very aggressive and not sustainable way. Of course, then what's the tension between um, like some of the management and, uh, and the open source developers, which didn't really spoke the same language. Um, then some of the contributors started to leave the project because they felt like not really at home. This was partly like just a feeling. If you're dealing with people that speak a different language, really talk about, I don't know, selling and quarterly numbers and stuff all the time. Um, but also like real world problems, and we'll talk about this later. Um, and of course, there were some other problems that um, led to a not so good um, solution. Um, maybe I talk a little bit about the business model first um, to explain this. So um, OldCloud at the time decided to, um, to go with a dual licensing business model. Some of you might know how this all works. The idea is basically that everybody who contributes to the software signs this contract, a contributor license agreement, which transfers the ownership of this piece of code or artwork or whatever it is to the company so that the company has then the right to do whatever they want with it. For example, release it under different licenses they choose. Um, and, and in this case, also like release it partly under the HEPL um, or other licenses. Um, so this is what ha had to happen. And then the company has the right to release it under different licenses. In the case of OwnCloud, OwnCloud, the core of it is available under HEPL still but it's also available under proprietary license. So if you're a company and say, hey, I don't want to have this deal with this evil free software stuff here, then the, the company can say, no problem. We have this great proprietary license for you. Do you if you prefer that, you can have it too. Costs you money, of course, but you can do this. The second business model, this piece of business model is the open core model that was chosen here. Open core means that only the basic functionality is available under free software license. Um, and the more advanced features are available under different license. So not open source, not free software. So in this usually means, and also in this case, that you have some sort of a community edition, which has some features, but more advanced features, the real features are only available in enterprise edition, and this is not free software. This is something, it's just normal proprietary software that you pay for and you buy, but it's nothing to do with open source. Um, and this is also what is what's chosen here. Um, the problem is that I think this open core business model is inherently not stable because it, you have this constant conflict between the community people and the company people because as a community contributor, you basically want to have all the functionality for free that's useful for you, right? That's usually how it works and if something is missing, you just add the feature. But the company has the interest to have certain advanced features only for themselves. So basically the company wants to have like less features as open source and more proprietary and the community the other way around. So you have this constant fighting, this constant discussion and you have like, I don't know, some person might write a feature and then the company blocks it because this, they have the feature too and they want to sell it. So having it available for free is not good. So you have this constant, constant fighting here. So this is a bit of a challenge. We have this whole area of product management which is a challenge because as I said in the example of KDE, it usually works that every contributor can just write whatever feature they want. They just send a pull request, and if it's working and it's good, then it's merged in, and that's it. Of course, if you're a company, um, or this kind of company, then you need some kind of predictability of the roadmap because you have to promise your customer, look, this is how the next release will look like. But if you have this community process, you don't really exactly know how it looks like. It's more agile, right? There's just a pull request comes in, you don't even you don't even know that it exists, but it's just a nice feature, and then suddenly you have a nice feature, totally unplanned, which is great, you have this feature, but it's not how some of the companies think. Predictability, that's a thing. So one time, maybe a small story, one time we had um, the challenge that um, some of our guys um, promised our investors that a certain feature, I think it was, uh, was the server-side encryption, 
is available in OwnCloud 5. Unfortunately, at the time, the feature was not really stable and was not ready, so it wasn't ready for the next release. So, but because of that, we had to name the next release after 4, not 5, but we had to really, uh, name it 4.5. Right? Because there was this promise that a certain feature is in 5, and the feature is not there, it can't be called 5. So it's all kinds of stupid stuff like that. So it's just a different way of thinking. And of course, some community members, they wrote like features, basically du duplicating enterprise features, and then there, you had to block it because you want to have, be paid for this. So that's a problem. The investors, of course, they were US-based investors, and I have no problem at all with venture capital and investment. It it's, it's, can work in certain cases, but it has to be aligned between all the people. Um, in this case, um, we had US-based investors, and they really wanted to have a US-based company because, hey, only in the US you can do a real IT company. In Europe, you don't know what IT is, so it has to be a real US company. And also, you want to have like real US customers, um, which was a bit of a problem for us because the way own cloud works is that it really basically secures your data and protects your data, but this whole privacy and data protection stuff is really strong outside the US, but not really inside the US. So actually, we attracted a lot of customers outside the US, but they were considered like bad customers because you really want to grow inside the US. So it's this whole, this whole bullshit. Um, and the next problem is that, as I mentioned before, this whole category that we had here was called by Gartner Enterprise Files Sync and Share. So at the beginning when I started OwnCloud, there was not even a name for it, but later it was called Enterprise Files Sync and Share, defined. So because of that, we had to do everything that was in this box, Enterprise Files Sync and Share. But if there are other features, for example, our community, they contributed an awesome calendar and contacts and and, and notes and RSS reader and all these nice features that are really popular in the community, but uh, the company always like blocked this because that's not our product category. We don't need that. That's groupware, that's whatever, something else. So this was this whole conflict of what are we really and because as a community person, you don't care, right? You, you do what you want and if it's useful and other people like it too, then you have a nice feature. In this case, a calendar, but it's not the interest here. So at the end, um, we had a situation where we had really an unhappy community. Like I said, a lot of people actually left, said, hey, I don't, not, don't play this game here anymore. This is, I want to have a real project, not like work for a big VC-funded company. Um, we had not happy employees because they thought that they were working on an open source company, but then had to develop proprietary features. Um, and then um, also not happy customers because the customers thought that they're actually using an open source solution. But once they talk to the co company and say, hey, I want to have this, they say, yeah, no problem, get this enterprise edition, just pay here and um, use this under this license, which is a proprietary license. And if they stop paying, they're not allowed to use the software anymore one minute later, which is just a complete proprietary software model. It's nothing to do with open source. So open source is used as a marketing tool here, it's a community edition but companies don't really use it. So it's a real like, interesting situation here. So I tried to fix that, um, but I, I failed. So I couldn't really, the setup of this whole thing was not really done in a way that me and others could steer this into a working direction. Um, there was alignment between the open source principles and this, this, um, this other setup didn't really work out. And at the end, it really, it really didn't work. And now we have an interesting situation because this is not unusual. This is just how startups work. Sometimes you try something, sometimes it works, sometimes it fails, and if it fails, you just shut it down and you do something else. That's how all the startups work. Most startups fail anyways, and that's not a problem. Um, of course, in this situation, it's like the customers would have lost their products and employees and the community and so on, but yeah, we shut it down and do something else. But of course, because the core of it was still HGPL open source, there actually was the opportunity to fork it and to reboot it. And that's something that's unique and that's only possible because of the free software licensing model. Right? Because usually this just would be dead and 
I don't know, the, the software would be owned by the bank or I don't know. Um, but in this case, there was actually the opportunity to, to reboot it. And then this led to the, to the next cloud fork. So the situation is that like in May 2016, like one and a half years ago, um, 12 of the core people basically left and decided to, hey, let's start over. Let's learn from the mistakes. Maybe we can do this better. Um, and um, yeah, um, started over. The first thing we did was the, that we all locked ourselves into a, into a house in Stuttgart and Germany for a week. So we all basically um, locked ourselves down and talked for a full week about, hey, how would we do this? What was good in the past? What was bad in the past? How should the business model look like? How should the community relations look like? How should, basically, how should this whole company and project look like so that we can still work here in 20 years? Because none of it was interested and still not interested in some kind of exit or selling it or something to anyone. We only want to have something sustainable, a project that is sustainable and a company that's sustainable and just a normal boring thing without fancy venture capital, just something that we can all work for in 20, 30 years. So and this is what we discussed like for, for, for a week. We, and then we came up with some principles, some guiding principles that we, that we decided to follow. Um, the first is that we really want to have a sustainable organization and that we don't accept external investment. So, um, so the next lot, the company is, um, has no external investment, is still owned by everybody who is like working in the company. Um, and this is something which gives us like independence and no external pressure to do certain things to, I don't know, to raise certain amount of money or customer numbers or quarterly numbers or whatever. Of course, we have the pressure to be, to make sure that we can all pay our rents. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about the business model later. But we just decided that we don't want any external investment. Second principle, and maybe this should be the first, I don't know, is that we decided that everything we do should be open source and free software. So um, we do everything as free software. So um, we re-implemented all these proprietary enterprise features. That's very nice, thank you. <laughs> it's, yeah, that's very nice. Good that we have the, the same ideas and same principles. Um, so um, we re-implemented all these proprietary enterprise features and released them under open source. We, um, um, yeah, there are a few things we had to fix. For example, the iOS app, we couldn't fork because of the and not working licensing, so we had to work with a partner um, to use this app that we later convinced the partner to open source it too. So the iOS app is now also completely uh, GPL, and we even added a special clause to the GPL which makes it compatible with the Apple App Store. So it's actually everybody can take it and put it into the App Store, which wasn't possible in the old model. So it's really we, 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 we fixed this, and it's, it's, all, it's all free software. Next thing is um, that we killed this contributor agreement thing. So um, no one who contributes to Nextcloud has to transfer any rights to, a, to our company. That's not needed because we don't do this dual licensing anymore. We don't do the open core anymore. We don't need it. And we also don't need to collect some intellectual property here because we need this because we want to sell it later to some other companies. We don't plan to do this, so we don't collect any intellectual property. The only thing we do is we have a real open source business model. I'll talk about it later where we sell support, and for this, there is no write on the code needed. It's just that we basically employ some of the core people of Nextcloud, which means we are able to support the software in a good way, and this is what companies pay us for. So no more contributor agreement. You just, um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, so this is something, um, it just works the same as with other projects, with KDE or GNOME or the Linux kernel itself, where everybody keeps their own individual copyright on their piece of code. Of course, and the agreement is that we all agreed on some license. In our case, on the server, is the HGPL. The clients are under the GPL. This is where all contributors have to agree on to use this license for their piece of code. 
but the code itself is still owned by the contributor, which is then gives us the, basically the situation that we have a shared ownership of the code base, which some people say is a bad thing because there is no way to ever change the license of it because you would need the agreement from thousands of people. Some people say this is bad. You can also say it's good. I think it's actually good because no one can, can fuck this up. This is just, this always is the license, this, and it will always stay the license. Um, and I think it's just a nice insurance that we have this shared ownership here. Then, of course, we use open standards for everything. So we use existing standards if they exist. For example, WebDAV we use for the file transfer. If there are other pieces where no open standard exists, like for the federated sharing, we um, invented our own standard, publish it and release it and work with others to adapt it to, to make it a real standard. Um, federation and decentralization, I mean, this is the whole point of everything. So we, as a company, we don't have any infrastructure, we don't have any server, we don't have any user accounts, nothing. We just like give people the, the software, you can run it wherever you want. Um, and you can federate and distribute between it, but distribute it not through us. So we are done not in a central position somehow. Um, that's a very important principle. We use um, open source. <laughs> Thank you. We use open source community processes, which means all the feature requests, all the bugs, everything we do, all discussions are in, in GitHub in our case. Everybody can have a look, so um, contribute. There's nothing really happening behind closed doors. There are like, I don't know, a tiny bit of communication which requires like talking about a specific customer who, where we have signed an NDA, but it's only for sub projects. And the overall product discussion is everything, um, everything's in the open. And we don't have this, I don't know, secret roadmap documents anymore or that we present to someone. Everything happens on GitHub. And the last thing is that's really important for us is diversity. So um, I have to say that we are not doing great here. It's similar to lots of open source projects. We have a lot to do, but this is something which we think is really important. So we um, are active in different organizations. So last week, I think we, we got approved to be part of uh, Rails, of the Rails Girls initiative and some others. So we really try to, to build up a community and a company which is diverse. That's really important. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about the business model because at the moment I just presented, yeah, we are so nice, we can do everything for free, we are really open, right? You might wonder how do we actually make money, um, <laughs> which is important if we want to be sustainable, right? We don't want to get any spent money that comes from the bank. We want to get spent money that comes from real customers. Um, so we have to be sustainable. So we have to have a real business model. And here we um, just got the inspiration from, uh, yeah, well, the biggest open source companies out there. So if you um, look at what Red Hat and SUSE are doing, for example, Red Hat is the open so uh, biggest open source company in the world, as you know. Um, this is exactly what we, what we copied, basically, their business model, which means um, everything we do is open source and free software, and we sell support subscriptions um, to companies. And we focus here on big enterprises. So there, I think there is no way that we try to monetize charge like home users or small installations or whatever. This is not the plan. Um, we sell like support subscriptions to the big organizations, which the organizations who have thousands of users. So um, this, is, this is really important. The way this usually works is if you're, if you're the IT department of a big bank or a big government organization or big university, then you usually want to have a service level agreement or something. You want to have a phone number that you can call if something is not working, a ticket. You want to, if everything explodes, you want to be able to call the, the developer who wrote the code in the first place, right, to have right, direct contact um, to the people to solve this. Um, and this is what we sell. So we have this support subscription thing, um, and that's what we sell. Support, security consulting, scalability consulting, branding. So if you want to have a client with your logo in it, we can build it for you. Um, and professional service. So if you want to have a special feature and you want to pay for this feature, you can pay us and we develop the feature for you, which then again will be open source after that. Um, so this is what we offer. The important uh, thing here is that we don't have any vendor login. 
not like certain other, other business models where you, if you stop the subscription, that you're not allowed to use the software anymore. That's not the case here, right? It's free software. You just take the software, do whatever you want, forever if you want, there's no restrictions. I think we offer great services for big customers. I think big organizations should pay us, but if you don't do, you can keep on using the software, it's not a problem. But there's no vendor login. I think this is also very important and like absolutely, absolutely most of our customers absolutely appreciate that. And I think they understand in the meantime some other business model where they talk about open source and nice, 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 and at the end you still have this login. Right. This is um, this is different here. So no vendor login, um, the right to distribute and change it inside and outside your organization, um, participate in the community. So actually, lots of our customers and and uh, and users actually contribute code back. Sometimes they work with they have their own developers or they hire different com development company and they say, hey, I want to have this feature and just move it back into, into the next cloud so it will be supported and part of the next release. So this is something which is really, more and more customers have actually understand this, that this is so much nicer than with proprietary software. If you buy like a Microsoft or Oracle product, there's just nothing you can do, right? You talk to your salesperson, say, we really would love to have this feature and they say, yeah, sure, and then nothing happens. Right? And then you can't fix it, right? Here we have actually an open process. You can ask us to fix it, you can pay us to fix it, you can pay someone else to fix it, you can fix it yourself and contribute it. You have all these options. And that's actually really powerful. The clear licenses, I find this very interesting that sometimes I talk to people who say that, yeah, this whole GPL stuff, that's so dangerous, right? It's so hard to understand what rights I give up and that's so crazy. I actually think it's the opposite. The GPL license is really well understood. There are so many lawyers and, and organizations who can explain it to you and it's really well understood. If you use some other software, if you, for example, use something from Oracle and it comes with a proprietary licensing, a licensing agreement, which, by the way, changes every week, right? Uh, and it's, I don't know, so long. Good luck with reviewing that and evaluating what consequence this license has on your long-term business and it changes all the time anyways. So I actually think that clear licenses, free software licenses are actually a good thing. Um, and of course, this whole open source thing is also an insurance that this whole solution you have keeps on existing, right? I mean, if the absolutely worst case happens and I don't know, I'm, I don't know, the whole Nextcloud community is run over by a bus or something, right? Then. Uh, it's like, it's still free software, you can still use it. So if you decide to use it as a strategic platform for your organization, it's still there. You can just go to some other developers and say, hey, can you fix this for me? That's possible. But if it's proprietary software, then you have this login and you can't really change anything. So a little bit of an outlook where we are today with Nextcloud um, and where we are going. Um, we have more contributions than ever, so this works out really well. We as a company, um, and uh, by the way, contributors, I think in the latest release, I'm not sure, I have to have to look it up, but if I remember correctly, like over 500 people contributed, like in the last release or something, it's really a nice number, but I forgot, but it's a nice number. <laughs> but we as a company, we also employ people, and we employ like 35 people, actually, I think there are three more now in the meantime, but um, we really, it's a nice number of, of, of employees and uh, a big part of you are actually engineers and people from the technical side and then a bit of sales and marketing and other stuff. Um, we are profitable, this is something that is really, it's really happy, so this crazy open source business model of giving everything away for free actually works, so um, <laughs> this is really nice. So we don't have any ex uh, external investment, which is really, which is really good. Our customer base are growing. It's like we have some nice government customers, bigger enterprises, bigger um, universities. It's really good, and we are still growing and hiring. Like I said, the last three weeks, I think I, I hired three more people alone, so it's really, really going well. Um, like I said before, no contributor agreement, 100% free software. Um, it's also, I mean, it's just amazing with the speed that, that our community does. So when we did a fork, we thought that we do the first release in two months. 
but actually the first release was ready two weeks after the fork already. So um, we, for example, merge all the pull requests with the same priority. It doesn't matter if the pull request comes from a random community person or from, from the core team. It doesn't matter. It's the same process, same for everything. Um, we don't have any roadblocks of community pull requests. So this has also happened in the past somehow where there was a policy that, hey, we do our own pull request and then merge, we merge one community pull, pull request per month. It's just crazy. This was in the Android app, by the way, where we had a really active community of contributors in the Android space, but the official developer sub-company that OwnCloud hired merged only one community pull request per, per month, so which completely killed the enthusiasm. And when we did the fork, I mean, I think they merged like over 100 pull requests in just a few weeks. And now, I mean, our client is, I don't know, we're moving at such a higher speed now than before. And it's really, really working well. I mean, we de do even crazy stuff that our website, our main website is also in Git. So community people can actually contribute to our company website by doing pull requests. Actually, we sometimes get credits that we have this really nice design on nextloud.com. Well, the designer actually is a community guy who just thinks that, hey, I want to contribute something and do it does all our designs, which is um, quite interesting. For <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's still, um, it's still, um, there's still challenges. I mean, when I came up with the name OwnCloud, I think um, this was not a totally bad idea. It's a good name. <laughs> so it's, um, it takes, um, takes some time to build up the awareness and everything. So if you look at Google Trends, for example, so you get a chart like that. Um, so it's still, um, and I just for fun, um, yeah, so here is like the OwnCloud site, and yeah, I think we overtook it like last few days here. Um, but it's still like a, it's still a long road. And I just talked with, um, with uh, Michael Meeks here on the stage a few minutes ago. I think one of the main guys in the LibreOffice project, there's some lots of others. That with LibreOffice and, and, and OpenOffice, we have a similar situation. Actually, I looked up the chart for them. It looks very similar. So it's also just now that they overtook like the old, the old brand, which is just, um, that's, it takes a while, but that's what it is. We're moving forward with really high, high speed in lots of areas. Obviously, it's too much stuff to read, but lots of improvements in key areas in collaboration, scalability, security. So I'm really happy that we are really innovating so fast. I want to point out only two features briefly. Um, one is the Next Loud Talk feature that we released like three weeks ago. That's a WebRTC-based video voice calling feature, so you can actually call people um, via WebRTC, um, and this is for group calls and video calls and audio calls and also group chats. Um, and it's, of course, again, running all on your own machine. Um, and we even have um, complete free software, um, Android and iOS apps for that. So you can actually, from your phone, call another person and it sends a push notification to your server and then maybe to the server of this other person and then from the server to the phone of this person and the phone rings and they click accept. And then you have an encrypted peer-to-peer, -peer, an encrypted peer-to-peer -peer connection between the phones, and you have this video call, and this is all on your own, all on your own server. Um, this is a nice new feature that we added to, to Nextcloud. And the second thing I want to point out is the end-to-end -end encryption for file sharing. This is also very new, one of the most requested features forever, and it took quite a while to do it because to figuring out how the key management, everything should work. But it is something that is coming next at 13, which is scheduled to be released next week. So really, really fast. Okay, and I want to. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I think I have to wrap up. Um, what Nextcloud is, what we are doing is uh, we want to build, or we are building, <laughs> an alternative to Dropbox, to Google Suite, and to Office 365. Like we want to have the sim a similar functionality, um, but with a few differences, obviously. First of all, completely self-hosted. Second is completely open source. And third is distributed and federated. So this is like the, the, in the nutshell, the, the mission that we have. And this is what we all want to do, like company and community together in a real 
sorry for the buzzword, win-win situation. I think this is possible and this is what we're trying to do. Okay, thanks a lot. I think we still have a few minutes for questions. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Awesome. Cool. Okay. <laughs> um, so, I think here's someone. Has own cloud started picking up code from next cloud? Uh, no, as far as I know, because um, they could. We release everything on, under HTML, but they want to have ownership of the of the code which means they decide to not take our code. That's their problem. How does your government uh, purchase uh, open source software? Sorry, say again. How, how does uh, government purchase open source software? Um, so, um, yeah, lately we were involved in a, in a big public tender, for example, that we also won um, for a big government to use Nextcloud. Um, this is just their standard processes, like for public tenders, and we participate in that just in a normal way. Sometimes, nowadays, only sometimes, um, there, are, there are requirements in the, in the documents that it has to be open source and free software. Um, but this is not, not always the case. I think in some state in Germany, in uh, Schleswig-Holstein, the, the government decided lately that this is a this is a requirement for all public software purchases or something, which is totally awesome. But in, uh, in most other cases, we still compete against the proprietary competitors. And then it's just a normal thing. It's like features, price. It's the normal game. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you, you target big customers. Mm -hmm. so you're obviously not the only one, so how hard was it to get to sit with these people and get their attention? How hard was it to do marketing, basically? Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's not, it's not easy, right? It's not that it, it's super easy. We have to fight for it every day. We have to um, do lots of marketing to tell people that Nextcloud exists. I mean, our competitors from, from Microsoft, uh, Google, they're doing a really good job. So we have to say, hey, we are also here, we are also here, we are small, but still we are here. Um, then we have to compete against um, just the features and uh, a lot of it's trust. A lot of it, I mean, we are an organization that's one and a half years old. And um, sometimes customers ask, okay, why should I buy you against Microsoft? That's like, yeah, that's something that's not, not easy. Um, but... Um, I don't know, at least in, in, in Europe, it's working very well at the moment because people understand that maybe, maybe it's a bad future if everybody's like using like one cloud vendor, which is like on the other side of the planet. Maybe this login effect, this dependency on someone um, is really too strong. So um, we got quite some requests from companies, organizations, governments who say, hey, it's we pick you because we have to be independent. So this, this works well. Um, your, your old company was uh, funded by some, yep. <laughs> uh, by open source uh, people. And now you mentioned that um, the, the company did only accept one, one pull request and with the company uh, wanted to have dual license. Can you elaborate a little bit on how that happened? Did the venture capital uh, people um, give you these, these, these uh, guidelines or how, how did it happen? Um, I hope you understand that I want to go and not go into too much detail here because it has to do with people. Um, but it's, um, yeah, I mean, there were lots of discussions. There was lots of pressure to, um, to make money. And making money is like, in the short term, actually works by forcing the customer to pay you. And then if it's a proprietary feature, then they have to pay you. Um, I think it's true. If you force the customer to pay you, it works well in the short term. I think in the long term, it's bad because 
happy customers are actually good customers, but this is like a long-term thing, which it's maybe not so important if the only thing that you care about is the next quarterly number. So, yeah, lots of ongoing discussions at the end. The, the free software people like couldn't like, yeah, couldn't influence it too much. Um, I would have assumed that, or uh, could have imagined that even with the old uh, model, um, some fraction, maybe large fraction of the customers was uh, paying you because they were actually interested in uh, service sort of by the new uh, uh, model rather than because they required a, a proprietary feature. Um, so I would have guessed that um, your new model would probably work well because I always would have assumed that's the main reason for paying you. Is that somewhat true, or, is it, or could it, do you have an idea of what fraction of the old customers were buying you for that reason or for the other? Um, that's a good question. I don't know it exactly. I mean, there is, for example, one business model in the past was the, the dual licensing, which is basically, hey, if you don't like GPL, HGPL, pay us, then you get it under whatever license you want, not GPL. So this is something which we don't offer anymore. So this is something I can judge. Um, and I think I, I had it zero times in the existence of Nextcloud, but I think once in the existing of, of OwnCloud before that a company really, really wanted to have that. I think it was, if I remember correctly, it was some American bank or something who has a policy that GPL is evil and no GPL here. Um, but besides that, that's not a problem. So I don't know. Usually I ask them, hey, do you have a Linux server somewhere? See, it's also GPL. Does it hurt you? No. So, yeah. So this is fine. Um, then um, the second thing about the enterprise extensions, that's, I mean, they get the same features from us, just under free software, which is, they don't complain, right? This is like, fine. <laughs> but it's true. That I think that most of the customers there want to have a support contract, service level agreement, they want to have a guarantee they get the security patches in time, and so on and so on. And this is the, the main motivator. And I think it's the same if you buy a Red Hat subscription or, or SUSE or something over like Debian. That's the main difference. The, this insurance that you get support and you have someone call and so on. That's the same for us. I would say this is the motivation for 95% of the people. So uh, I want to first congratulate you to choosing this model. I'm the CEO of XWiki, and we very much align on the on the rules that you set. Uh, and I wanted to know uh, uh, how did you pay the salaries initially after the fork, and uh, how long did it take to get profitable, and how many customers do you have? <laughs> yeah, um, good questions, precise questions. <laughs> um, yes, that's the first question about uh, the, the salaries. That's indeed uh, was a challenge because, as I mentioned, we uh, we um, were like 12 people at the beginning with zero customers, right, in the first day. Um, so this was a challenge. So this is something that was um, we are able to compensate with. Um, I don't know private money from the people together who were involved. Um, then uh, relatively quickly, we um, got like the first customers. So this like went really well. In fact, like the biggest customer signed up, I think at the end of 2016, which then directly made us profitable. So it, we're lucky in a way, I don't know, that we got like a really big one really fast. Um, so this was good. And since then we are hiring more people and getting more customers. And at the moment, I think we have a bit over 100 customers. One or two last questions. Talk about money again. Um, now with the experience of two companies financing open source and with services emerging like Bounty Source or Patreon or such, uh, what can you recommend the community as a whole to get more people to be paid for contributing to open source. 
That's a big question. I'm not sure I can answer that, and also not in one minute. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's something we have to figure out. I think this is something, I, I, I think you agree, that's why you asked the question. This is something we all have to figure out. If you really want to change the world, if you want to make it better, I really think we need to have more, more people, more, more investment, more time, more full-time developers, and so on. So, I mean, there's a lot we can do, like as volunteers, but I think if you really want to, like this, with this whole threat in, in the cloud area, which is threat on mobile, which is totally locked down, which totally locked down um, artificial intelligence, which totally locked down IoT, like all these upcoming battles where if we want to be relevant as an open source free software community, then we need to figure out some way to make money then to be able to pay people. So this is super important. And how to do this, that's, that's the big question, yeah. I mean, um, with, I'm not sure I can answer that. You need some kind of business model. All I can say here is that pick a business model which doesn't work against open source, otherwise uh, you're not open source, and otherwise you lose all your, your support. Um, and then you'd have nothing, right? So you have to pick something which works for all involved parties. What it is, I, I can't answer that now. I mean, this is what works for us, but this is only one solution. So this only works because we are something that's useful in the enterprise market. If, if it would be something that's not interested for enterprises, for example, if we would do, I don't know, toasters or something, right? This wouldn't work. But figuring something out is really important. With the general data protection regulation, GDPR, coming in, do you feel that's going to drive more people towards solutions like Nextcloud for self-hosting to bring things in-house, or do you think it's going to drive people to Office 365, Google Apps, to you know, have the protection of the big company? I, hard to say, but I think it would actually help um, solutions like Nextcloud and other self-hosted open source solutions. I think so because it's, I don't know, at the end of the day, it just gives you more freedom and more, more flexibility to do, to do certain things and then to be compliant to certain regulations. If you're just a customer of, of a software as a service solution, then you uh, get what you get. And if there's a new regulation because you're in, I don't know, healthcare or some other market, then if it's not there, then it you're just out. So I think at the end of the day, what we do is always more flexible and always better. But of course, it's again an uphill bit, a battle, right? Because Microsoft and others are not stupid. They also work with the politicians to make sure that they're compliant. But yeah, I, at the end, I think it creates awareness and it helps like our community altogether here, yeah. Thank you, Frank.